So in the first question, we're asked to state what is meant by the term covalent bond. Well, just to remind you, the covalent bond is made because in the middle, you've got a shared pair of electrons and it is a very strong electrostatic attraction between the shared pair of electrons in the middle and the positive nuclei of each atoms bringing those closer together. So this is how I define a covalent bond. A strong electrostatic attraction between the negative shared pair of electrons and the positive nucleus. The next part says methane is a hydrocarbon and as a molecular formula of CH4, draw a dot and cross diagram for a molecule of methane show outer electrons only. So before I launch to the methane molecule drawing, it's good to think about carbon is in group four, so it uh, makes four covalent bonds, it shares four electrons, whereas hydrogen it only has one electron and therefore it only needs to share one electron to make one covalent bond. So carbon has to make four covalent bonds. You can see hydrogen only has to make one covalent bond. So I would, before I draw a molecule of methane, just think about that first and maybe sketch that in the corner. So we've got carbon in the middle. And then we've got our four hydrogens here. And we're going to have four covalent bonds. Hydrogen only has one electron, so it's shared. It's a nothing count here on the outer part of the um, shell. And carbon has four electrons. It's shared. It's four. So therefore, that is the finishing diagram. Remember, you can also draw it like this. The melting point of methane is minus 182 degrees. Explain in terms of intermolecular forces the melting point of methane. I've got methane molecules over here. Remember the intermolecular forces are weak forces between the molecules. These are non-polar molecules, so will only experience temporary dipole to dipole forces, which are also called van der Waal forces. And therefore not much energy is needed to overcome them. So for the three marks, this is what I would write. The molecules experience weak intermolecular forces between them of temporary dipole to dipole forces. So little energy is needed to overcome these forces. A phosphorus atom contains 15 electrons. Complete the electron configuration for phosphorus. Well, going back to this, remember the first shell, subshell, is just the S shell, which is two electrons. Then you go into the second shell where you've got the subshell 2s2, which is two electrons. And then of course, you've got up to six electrons forming here for the 2p. And then you fill up the 3s and then the 3p. So you can use your periodic table at the back to help you with this, but you've got 15 and you've already uh, used uh, 10. So we've got five left to do. So we'll have 3s2, that will give us another 2, which means we've got 3 left, so it'll be 3p3. And just to double check, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It then says an oxygen atom contains 8 electrons, complete figure 1 showing the arrangement. Remember the electrons fill from the bottom and they fill um, with the opposite spin um, so they repel less. So that's the first uh, shell done. That's one, two, three, four. And then remember, they fill separately in the P shell individually. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you come back and start filling with the opposite spin. And that is eight. And we're only going up to eight electrons. Which equation shows the first ionization of potassium? Remember, the first ionization energy is the energy needed to remove the first electron from a mole of potassium atoms in a gaseous state. So we've got to show moving an electron out of potassium in a gaseous state, which means potassium will have a plus one ion. 
So it starts as a neutral atom, then turns to positive ion and electron, so it is D. Now, this question is quite tricky at first, but it's easier once I've explained it to you. So it says figure two shows the first six ionization energies of an unknown element. So this is about one element, and it's about removing the first electron, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, all the way up to removing six electrons to make it a six plus ion. So we've got to identify which group it is in. Now, it probably helps to do it this way. If you imagine you're taking out four electrons. So once you take out the first electron, it will become a positive ion. So that's the first electron removed. So because it becomes a positive ion, it's going to take more energy to remove the second electron because it will be attracted to the positive ion. So now you've moved the second electron, which takes uh, even more energy. Then you move the third electron, which takes a little bit more because it's becoming more positively charged. And then you move the fourth electron, which means that this ion has become even more charged. Now you can see if you remove another electron, then you're going to keep going up in energy to remove it because the charge on the ion is going to continue to become more positive. But there seems to be a massive leap between the fourth and the fifth. And that is because you are then removing an electron from the next shell down, which actually needs more energy because it's closer to the nucleus. So the way to think about this is that this must be in group four because once you've removed four electrons, you're then removing it from the shell below. So the answer is group four. Calcium is a metal. Word equations for two reactions of calcium are shown. Calcium plus oxygen goes to calcium oxide and calcium plus hydrochloric acid goes to calcium chloride plus hydrogen. Complete the word equation for the reaction of calcium with sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid is hydrogen sulfate. So we'll get calcium sulfate plus hydrogen. And you need to know metals plus acid go to salt plus hydrogen. Next thing, write a balanced equation for the reaction of calcium with oxygen. So, we first of all got calcium as a, as a metal element, we then have oxygen as a molecule, and that will produce calcium oxide, and now we have to check what the actual formula is for calcium oxide. Calcium is in group 2, so it forms a 2 plus ion, oxygen is in group 6, so it forms a 2 minus ion, so that is the right formula, calcium loses 2 electrons, oxygen gains 2. Now what we have to do, that was worth one mark, we now have to balance it. We've got two oxygens here, so we're going to have to multiply the whole of that by two, which means we're going to have to multiply that by two. You don't have to put this on top here, but it just helps to see uh, that that is the right formula for calcium oxide. The equation for the reaction of dilute hydrochloric acid with calcium is calcium plus hydrochloric acid goes to calcium chloride and hydrogen. It says calculate the maximum mass of calcium chloride produced by reacting 8.02 grams of calcium with excess hydrochloric acid. So that just means you've got enough hydrochloric acid for the reaction to take place. So the first thing I do to make sure I'm calculating the right thing is put the mass I know and what I need to calculate next to the equation. So I've been told the amount of calcium so I've got 8.02 grams of calcium. And I want to work out the mass of calcium chloride, which is here, some little question mark here. The next thing to do is think about the molar ratios. So we've got one mole of calcium, reacts with two moles of hydrochloric acid to make one mole of calcium chloride and one mole of hydrogen gas. So these react in a ratio of one to one. And what always makes it easier for these questions is they give you mostly the relative atomic mass and the relative formula mass to save you having to look at your periodic table on the back of the exam paper. So the equation we need to be using is the number of moles is the mass over the molar mass. Now, if we can work out the number of moles of calcium, knowing its mass, 
we know that the number of moles of calcium chloride is the same because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And once we know the number of moles of calcium chloride, we can work out its mass because we're given the molar mass. So firstly, we need to work out the moles of calcium. And that's going to equal N equals mass over molar mass. So show you working like this, the mass is 8.02 grams and the molar mass is 40.1 and that gives you 0.2 moles. Next is a ratio of 1 to 1 so I know the moles of calcium chloride 0.2 so if you need to rearrange the equation in a triangle then do so to make sure you don't make a mistake. We've got mass over molar mass which means the number of moles needs to go there so covering up mass mass is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass so the number of moles is 0.2 and the molar mass of calcium chloride is 111.1 and that gives you 22.22 grams Manganese, Mn, is a metal. It has a metallic structure. Explain why metals are malleable. Remember, first of all, the ions, the metal ions, are arranged in regular rows. And it's those rows that can slip over each other, making it malleable, which means you can bend it. It's only worth two marks, so it just needs the two statements. Metal ions are arranged in regular rows, so they can slip over each other, making the metal bendable. So we're now asked to calculate the relative formula mass of potassium manganate. So we've got one atom of potassium, which is 39.1, plus one atom of manganese, which you'll find is a transition metal. So it's 54.9 plus you've got four atoms of oxygen. Oxygen is here 16, so it's four times 16, and that all together will give you 158. So this is a six mark question, which comes at the end of each exam paper. And before you put pen to paper, you really must think about what you're going to say so you can think about a logical order for it to communicate your answer. So it says manganese and zinc are both metals in the D block of the periodic table. Table 1 shows some information about manganese and zinc. So they're both metals. This is a short electron configuration. So what the short means is this. If you look at your periodic table, manganese is there and zinc is here. And the short electro configuration says that manganese has the same electron structure as argon plus an extra 2 in the 4s and an extra 5 in the 3d. Whereas zinc has the same electron structure as argon but has two electrons in the 4s and it has 10 electrons in the d so it has a full d subshell and you're also told that manganese has these common oxidation states so forms ions of 2 plus 4 plus and 7 plus whereas zinc only forms a 2 plus ion so discuss why manganese is classified as a transition metal but zinc is not. The first remember is that any elements where the last electron is in the D shell is in the D block. So it's a member of the D block. But not all of these are classified as transition metals. Because a transition metal is one that forms more than one type of of stable iron, for instance, 2 plus or 4 plus or 7 plus, with an incomplete D shell. Whereas zinc, of course, only forms one 2 plus iron, and as we'll see in a minute, that 2 plus iron has 
a full D shell. So let's have a look before we write anything. If we take two electrons from zinc, then of course you can see if we take two electrons from 4s because you take those electrons off first, you can see that the shell underneath, that the 3D shell, is still full. So that is an iron with a full shell, so it is not a transition metal. Whereas you can see manganese, if we take two electrons away, then that leaves the 3D shell with only five electrons in it, which isn't full because it takes up to 10. If we move four electrons from here, then we move the two from there and two from here, which leaves 3D3. The 3D shell is not full. But if we take seven away, that's two and five. That takes all of that away, which leaves the iron with an electron arrangement of argon, which is a positive iron with a full outer shell. So that doesn't count as one of its ions that uh, is left with an incomplete D shell. And of course, the other thing we know about transition metals is that they form colored compounds or colored solutions, and they also are used as catalysts. So how are we going to put all of that into this six mark question? I will take you through how I would answer the question. Both manganese and zinc are in the D block as their outer electrons are in the D subshell. However, zinc is not a transition metal as it has a complete D subshell of 10 electrons. It also only forms one iron plus two which also has a complete D subshell. And we can now put the formula for that, AR 3D10 2 plus. Manganese is a transition metal as it has an incomplete D subshell, only five electrons. It forms three ions, two of which have an incomplete D subshell, making it a transition metal we can then write the short electron configuration of those ions. So the plus two ion has lost the four S2 electrons and so has a configuration of argon and subshell 3D5. And the plus four ion has lost four electrons, so two from the four S2 subshell and then two from the 3D shell giving it only three electrons in all in the 3D shell. The other plus seven iron has a full outer shell, plus seven AR. Also, manganese will produce colored compounds and are used for catalysts. Whereas zinc produces white compounds and does not act as a catalyst.